good start to the day. Um, anything? Um, yes, Your Honor. I included the court on some emails last night between myself and the prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, I have three specific witnesses that they subpoenaed okay. that I've asked them to hold the subpoenas on. Okay. But the prosecution, I know that a trial is a moving part has lots of moving parts. Okay. I need to know when the defense case is going to begin because I cannot coordinate with witnesses and have them sitting here all day, every day. Do you, is it, do you think it's going to be today or tomorrow? Judge, as I indicated in the email last night, there were nine- I read it at four o'clock this morning, but yeah. There are nine potential prosecution witnesses left. Yeah. Counsel this morning indicated that she would like Wendy and Phil Sodden here, as well as Brian Maloche. They've been okay. subpoenaed. Right. Mr. and Mrs. Sodden are her client's parents. They've been contacted and told to come sit in the court unless and until the defense counsel or the prosecution chooses not to call them. So I can't predict when the trial is going to end for the prosecution. Okay. I can tell the court no, we have a potential of nine witnesses left. Okay. As the evidence comes in, we may decide to call all nine or we may not decide as we do in every single case. Judge. Okay, so let's check in after lunch and about three or four o'clock. Right? I, would, I would appreciate that. Yeah. I am having a very difficult time because the prosecution is not extending professional courtesy to me to give me any information and I'm dealing with my own witnesses. I'm in court doing this. I am a one-man show, and the very least that could happen is that I'm telling me who's gonna be called and who's not. This, Judge, this happens in every trial. This happens in every trial. Yesterday, um, the first witness was, was two hours late, so at, that impacts things, right? So the, the weather impacted things. So I, I don't think that they are not obligated to tell you in what order and who is next, but I think that they have been extending a professional courtesy. I, I understand your Thank difficulty you, and we're gonna we're gonna do our best. You, you know, it's also hard to predict how long the witness will be. Some witnesses I and mean, there there are witnesses where you have no questions, which which is which is great. I, right? But there are witnesses that you that you, you spent some time on. There are witnesses they they spent a long time on. So it, it's hard to predict. We're gonna we're gonna check in several times today. I'm not going to tell you your witness isn't in the hallway so you can't call them. I'm not going to do that. I understand. I yeah. guess my fear is that if we get to a point where suddenly they have no witnesses <clears throat> and I don't have witnesses here because I had no heads up, I don't want this court to be mad at me that that we're wasting time. I am trying my absolute best. That's I what I want are. the court to this know. This is the heads up. I, I, this is the heads up. I'm, I'm aware. I, I have sat where you are sitting and had to coordinate witnesses and I know how difficult it is. I, I am aware. So I I'm, I understand that. All right. So d don't worry about that. We'll, we will check in several times today and see how it's going. I mean, things happen. Things happen. Witnesses are, are quicker than we thought or take longer than we thought. So I, I obviously am very interested in keeping the trial moving, which is what we're gonna do right now. That's great, Judge. Okay, and that's and we good. indicated let's just have defense counsel's witnesses ready to go, as we have, and-, and Right, when, was, when? So. That's okay. all I wanna know. Like, what day? I don't Even think, a day they don't that's... know. They okay. don't know. It, it doesn't sound like it's gonna be today. Well, that was if my big concern. Nine Last night I was emailing them because I didn't know if they would get through today. Okay, sometimes sometimes a witness is 10 minutes long. I understand. I, Today. It's it not be. your first rodeo, Miss Smith. You Which is why I've yeah. seen this unfold before. And okay. when they said our case will be done by the end of the week, that's far, far sooner than we've ever expected. Which is fine and great news. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to plan. I understand. I've been there many, many, many times. So let's do it. Let's bring that. Thank you.
Lieutenant Sam Mars. Good morning. Good morning. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about the evidence of truth to help you God? Yes, Your Honor. All right, could you uh, step up and have a seat? And then we will state your name for the record and spell your first and last name. Sam Marsband, first name's S-A-M, last name M-A-R-Z-B-A-N. Go ahead, cross it. Yeah. Good morning, Lieutenant. Good morning. Can you tell the jury uh, what your occupation is and how long you've been doing that? Uh, I'm a detective lieutenant with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. I, it'll be 20 years in July. And as a lieutenant um, in your capacity right now, what are your duties? I am the commander of the City of Pontiac uh, Detective Bureau. And what does the, the City of Pontiac Detective Bureau do? What sort of investigations? Um, we do investigations, everything from minor property offenses all the way up to homicide. All right. And in your over 20 years of experience, how many homicide investigations have you um, taken part in? Uh, well over 100. Okay. Do you... I want to take you to November 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? Yes. All right. At, at some point, were you informed that there was a, a school shooting at Oxford High School? Yeah, so I was in the Pontiac substation. I was informed there was an active shooter at Oxford High School. And what did you do? Uh, I grabbed my radio, uh, went down to my car, um, and there were other detectives gearing up, loading up in unmarked cars, and uh, we went lighting sirens to Oxford High School. Okay, and when you arrived, can you describe uh, what you observed when you pulled into the, the complex? Uh, so we, we pulled in. Um, there was a heavy presence on the north side of the building. Uh, so we moved around. We put our vehicles on the east side of the building, so there was some coverage there. And then uh, we put our vests on, uh, grabbed, our, grabbed our rifles, and went in through the east side of the building. And if you know, do you, do you know what time that was? It was probably shortly after 1 p.m., Okay, and at that point when you entered the building, uh, and you said you grabbed your gear, what are, can you describe what that means? Uh, a ballistic vest, a uh, rifle, handgun, and uh, police radio. Okay. What information did you have when you entered the building? Um, as, as we were pulling in, we could see ambulances were, were leaving. There were still ambulances on the scene. Um, we knew that there had been several casualties, uh, both fatal and non-fatal. Um, as we were getting ready to go in, uh, we learned that there was at least or there was one suspect in custody. Uh, there was still, everything was so, uh, there's so much information coming in, it wasn't clear yet at that point if there was another person involved or not. So it wasn't clear whether there was one shooter or more than one shooter? That information was, uh, was evolving um, as we were basically getting ready to go in. Okay. Uh, when you entered the building, did you ever make t contact with Lieutenant Willis, the, the city next to you? Yes, after, after we were searching the building um, and we evacuated some students, I did make contact with Lieutenant Willis. Okay, so backing up, what was the first thing you did when you entered the building? Um, the first thing we did, we, I had a team of probably three other detectives that were with me, and we conducted a systematic search, making sure there was no other victims, no other, shoot, uh, no other shooters inside. Uh, there were still students locked in classrooms, and once we made those areas safe where we could safely evacuate them, we brought those students out. Um, so they so that they can be uh, taken to another location and be uh, picked up by family. Um, once that was all done, uh, we did that primary search of the entire school. That's when I went to the front office and I met with uh, Lieutenant Willis and the other investigators. Can you describe to the jury what that experience of me coming across a classroom where there are kids in it? How did you how did you evacuate that that classroom safely? Um, and what were the difficulties in, in getting into the door? Uh, well, the doors had been locked and barricaded, um, so we had to identify ourselves. I was, I was not one of the people communicating. I was more in a supervisory role, trying to coordinate with the radio and, and other, other teams that were searching the schools. But we wanted to make sure that there was a safe path, uh, that we weren't going to bring them out into harm's way. So we made sure that whatever route out of the building that they had, there was uh, police presence there. Were there any other concerns evacuating kids <coughs> Um, other than their safety um, going through the hallways? Were you concerned about anything else? Yes, we were, we obviously we didn't want them to be exposed to areas of the school that were a crime scene. Um, the area that I had searched um, initially upon entry, there was, there was no victims in the hallways. Okay. 
Um, what is it you do if you're trying to evacuate a classroom in a hallway where there are, are victims there? How did you shield those kids from that? Um, basically, you would set up a screen. It would be like a, a screen of law enforcement personnel shielding their view from, from seeing what, what occurred. Okay. Um, about how long did it take you to direct these this, these primary and secondary searches? Um, I, was, I was only involved in the primary search. I would say it was probably about an hour. Okay. Um, and you said at some point you went and met up with Lieutenant Willis or the, or the command? Yes, I met with Lieutenant Willis and other investigators from the Special Investigations Unit. And I, I think sometimes we get um, lost about, we assume people know things. Talk to me about the ranking, the ranking system at the Sheriff's Office. Um, lieutenants are pretty uh, um, high rank, is that right? Yes, it'd be a command officer. Right, and then, um, so who's above a lieutenant? A captain. Okay, and did you have any captains in the building that day? I believe Captain Hill was there. Okay. I could, I could hear his voice on the radio. All right, other than that, were there other lieutenants? Uh, Lieutenant Willis, um, I think there have been some promotions since. I, I can't recall anyone, okay. anyone else. So you, what did you do? Uh, when you were done with that, what was your your responsibility? Um, I had what did you what did you what were you assigned to, or what did you choose to do? Uh, I was requested to um, identify uh, two of the, the deceased victims that were in the hallway. Okay, and you said you've been involved in a lot of homicide investigations. Yes. Uh, was this did this feel different to you? Yes, it was. It was kind of surreal with it being in a school, um, a place where kids are supposed to be safe. Uh, most of them are, you know, in houses that I've been involved in, or, or streets, or, or businesses. So it, it was different. Okay. Um, can you describe what you did? Um, I met up with a school resource, or I'm sorry, school uh, counselor, I believe, was Pamela Pine, and then Jim Rourke, who was a retired police officer and also uh, school security. Um, and we, we were tasked to identify two of the, the deceased victims. And uh, how did you do that, Lieutenant? I went down to the, the south hallway uh, where they were located. Was um, that the 200 hallway? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, the first victim had a coat on her. Uh, they were covering basically her upper torso and her head. Um, there was a backpack next to her. It wasn't on her. Um, Deputy Freiberg was with me as well, and uh, he looked through the backpack, found some school assignments. Uh, and at, at some point, were you able to determine who that that girl was on, on, on the floor? Yes. And who was it? Uh, Hannah St. Juliana. Okay. And what did you do? Um, we uh, looked at the mobile phone that Jim O'Rourke, Jim O'Rourke had, and uh, were able to identify her based on her school picture. Okay, and what was the purpose of doing this? Uh, so we could notify next of kin. Okay. And and what did you do next? Um, I went further east down that hallway. Um, there was another female victim uh, lying on the ground, again with a, a coat over her head, and she was wearing a backpack. She was still wearing it? She was still wearing a backpack. Do you know where, could you see where her injury was? Uh, she had a gunshot wound to the head. And what did you do? Um, I went into that backpack, I found a wallet, uh, I found a driver's license on or in that wallet uh, with the name Madison Baldwin. Um, I looked at the picture, I moved the coat off her head. Uh, she had uh, blood and, and hair covering her face, so I ended up moving her, her hair out of her face to identify her from her driver's license. Was, any, was anyone with you at the time? Um, detect, or Deputy Freiberg was with me, um, I believe Pam Fine was with me, and Jim Rourke, and there was other law enforcement personnel in the hallway. Okay, thank you. What did you do next? Um, I went back to the front office um, after we identified the two, um, and then I was requested to prepare a search warrant uh, for the shooter's residence. Okay. Well, at that point, what did you did you have anything of, uh, that was um, obtained from the shooter? Um, 
in preparation for the affidavit for the search warrant, basically, so I can put the facts in uh, to request the court grant me that court order. I, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I just want to back up. I, I, I need to ask that question first, which I think you knew. Um, what was the purchase, the purpose of the search warrants of the, of the home? <coughs> uh, to look for any more uh, evidence related to the, the homicide investigation. Okay. And is that something you normally do? Yes. All right. Um, and I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What, what did you, as a, as a, as, um, a matter of, of protocol, did you look at anything that was obtained from the shooter? I did. And what was that? Um, there was a couple things I looked at. Um, I'm sorry, was your question specifically what was obtained from the shooter? Yes, and, and why did you need to <coughs> obtain those things? Um, I looked at uh, the shooter's cell phone. Um, it was a locked screen. However, um, on, on the phone, when you could see that the messages had been received, so I could see what messages. I couldn't go into the phone, obviously. Um, but there were messages displayed on the screen, and I could see what those text messages were and okay. where they're from. Do you were you the first person to look at that phone? No. Okay. Were you the first person to um, <coughs> press the button so the screen would appear? If you know. I don't even think I pressed any button. I don't. I don't know. It's okay. If you move the phone, you know sometimes when when I pick up my personal phone, if I move it, the screen will light up and the the lock screen will appear. So okay. I can't recall if I pressed any buttons or not. Okay. Um, was anyone, where were you when you when you had the phone in it lit up? I was in the front of the school by the administrative offices. Okay, is there anyone with you? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Detective Anger from the computer crime. <coughs> okay, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put on the screen uh, People's 343. I don't believe there's an objection, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry, you said 343? Mm -hmm. That's the shooter's phone. It's the, the a screen capture of the shooter's phone. We have no objection. Thank you. 343 is important. All right, uh, Lieutenant, <coughs> is that your hand? Yes. Okay. And what are we looking at? Uh, this was the cell phone that was recovered from the shooter. Okay. And. We're going to try to magnify for a minute. The first message there, can you read what it says and who it's from? Um, the message is from mom. It was sent one hour prior. It says, Ethan, don't do it. Uh, the second. But hold on one moment. One, pri uh, one hour prior to what exactly? Um, one hour prior to. Um, whatever real time was, so one hour prior, prior to 3.03 p.m., approximately. Okay, do you know when the shooting began? 12.51, uh, I believe. Okay, and how long was Ethan Don't Do It um, after the shooting began? How, how long, what was the time span between the shooting began and that text came in? Um, the, the exact time's not displayed on there, it's just the approximate of one hour, but I would say at least an hour after the shooting. Okay, we, we have that in another exhibit. But, um, okay, and the next text, um, who's that from and what does it say? It says, Dad, Ethan, call me now. All right, and then the next text. Uh, it's from a phone number that is not listed as a contact. Um, and it says, did you get shot? Okay. Is it, I don't wanna ask a leading question. Were you able to tell from that screenshot what order those are in. Is the top one the, the most recent text or is the bottom one the most recent text? Uh, the top, or I'm sorry, the bottom would be the most recent. Okay. <coughs> and at that moment it said, it says, what is it, four, four, 47 minutes to go? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. What, if anything, did you uh, perceive when you looked at that phone? Did it cause any um, concern for you? Um, it, with the other information that I had, um, it provided knowledge that, that the senders of those text messages... Objection, be. Your Honor, is to speculation of what Mrs. Crumley's knowledge was. That would be speculation. So, um, I, I don't think 
he got a chance to say. But okay, his, can you repeat the question? Yeah, but I'm just asking to finish the answer because I, I don't think he's talking about her knowledge. I, but I don't. Talk to me about what, you said you did a search warrant for the electronics included, correct? Yes, okay. I was referring to my knowledge. Yes, I, I know, okay. I know that. I'm sorry okay. to okay. let you finish, but go ahead. So it, it provided me with information that the sender of these text messages uh, were aware of the search Your Honor, this is, again, the sender of the text messages was aware. He cannot testify to what the sender of text messages was aware of. Oh. If that's speculation. Your Honor, I'll move on. These I, are, I guess it is. These are, this is information that he is receiving in real time um, to perform his duties of an investigation. He doesn't, he, he we're, we're simply trying to um, establish why and what he did next. Yeah. So, well, it, I, I think the jury gets it. Okay. And Your Honor, would I object? I would ask that the court consider the objection prior to Ms. McDonald's. Sustained. Thank you. Okay. Um, one moment. I have a right to respond to an objection because okay, that's the court rules are the court rules. I'm not going to ask the question before the court rules, but I do, I, I before the court rules okay, on the objection. Okay, but when she objected, you didn't respond to the, to, to the objection. I, I was trying to respond. I okay. really was. Okay. I, I'm trying to explain to the court that this is what we're doing. So, okay, all right. Um, well, it's I'm not, not going to start really asking questions without, without a ruling. Okay. Um, Lieutenant, uh, what concerned you about this, and, and what did you do next? Uh, concerned me of uh, there was relevant information on electronic devices related to the shooting that had occurred. Um, with that, um, I viewed the surveillance video from the school, and I also observed uh, the firearm uh, that was used in the shooting in preparation for the search warrant. Um, so it helped me basically collect um, information uh, that what, what we might be looking for in, in the home. Uh, that we were seeking the search warrant for. Okay. And do you do you oh, do you know um, Special Agent uh, Brett Brandon from the ATF? I do. Okay. He testified early in these proceedings. Was he present with you at the school if, er, and assist in any way? I do remember seeing him in the school. Okay. Um, what did you do? Well, can you tell the jury what you um, requested in your affidavit for a search warrant and and why? Um. Uh, what I requested was any and all evidence related to uh, the homicide investigation, which included firearms, <coughs> ammunition, uh, firearms accessories like holsters or, or magazines, um, notes, uh, receipts, uh, electronic devices to include tablets, um, computers, cell phones, um, because we know that in those types of in these types of investigations, uh, messages could be sent to other individuals. Um, that might be witnesses or uh, be a part of that investigation in addition to plans. Um, so I guess that's just it. At that point, did you, were you informed or did you observe anything um, in the, the shooter's backpack that was found in one of the bathrooms? Um, I did not look through his backpack. Okay, so what did you do next? Um, I had to have my laptop, so I left uh, quickly, I had to have my laptop brought uh, to me to the school, and I, I sat there and I typed out a search warrant and uh, swore to that search warrant um, from the school. And then once it was authorized, I, I let my detectives that were that had secured that residence uh, that the judge had signed the court order, and they could begin searching. Did you speak to any of the students in the school that day? I did. Who did you speak to? Um, I believe his name was Keegan. And, and can you tell the court why you spoke to Keegan and and where he was during the shooting? Um, I spoke to him very briefly. Um, he was, when, when I talked to him, he was in one of the counselor's offices. And um, in my role, I was, I was in a supervisory role over the detective bureau, so I was trying to assist uh, Lieutenant Willis. And I was directing my detectives basically to uh, handle the handle the interviews, and then I, I learned that Keegan had uh, witnessed um, a homicide in the bathroom, and he was obviously very shaken up, and he was sitting in the counselor's office. Um, partly, I didn't want him to be alone, so I directed uh, Detective Stevens um, to, to stay with him and, and gather information from him. And that, do you know that victim's name? Was, you're talking about Justin Schilling, correct? 
Yes. Okay. And um, you, did you speak to Keegan because he had um, information that you needed about the shooter? He, yes, he did have information about the shooter as well. Okay. That Was that bathroom the site of the last um, student that was murdered? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you direct or um, ask any of any anybody to go to the house um, after you wrote the search warrant or while you were writing it? While I was writing it, I asked them to go to the house. Do you remember who you asked? Um, at that or I time, guess you ordered. Um, several different detec detectives there at that time. Uh, Lieutenant Hicks was sorry. He was before he was promoted. He was Sergeant Hicks, so he was my partner in the detective bureau. So I, I told them we need to get a team. Uh, go secure that house. I believe it was him, um, Detective Stoyak, and Detective Steele. And what, what, can you tell the jury what that means to secure the house? Um, basically, it's a protected suite. Um, so you're not, your purpose isn't to search for evidence yet while you're waiting for that search warrant to be signed, but you want to make sure there is no one in that uh, structure destroying any evidence. Um, before you can get that search warrant, because obviously it does take time to, to draft the document and get the judge to, to authorize it. So it was basically preventative um, from allowing stuff to be destroyed or, or taken out of the house. Uh, prior to drafting the search warrant, did you watch any surveillance video? I did. Can you tell the jury what you viewed? Um, I watched the surveillance video of that south hallway, I believe the, the 200 hallway. Um, shows the shooter going into the bathroom, uh, coming out moments later, and then immediately uh, the shooter began firing on students as he uh, walked east down that hallway. Um, were you able to determine what weapon was used? Yes. How did you determine that? Um, the weapon, uh, by the time I saw that weapon, it was already brought to the front of the school. Um, crime lab specialist, uh, Rachel Grace, had it in her possession, it was collected in an evidence box, and it was a SIG 9mm handgun. Okay, once the, how long did it take the search, um, for the search warrants to be uh, signed and authorized by a judge? Uh, probably, it was under an hour, I would say. Okay, and, and what did you do once you obtained the search warrant? Um, I, I called, I can't remember which detective I called, but one of the detectives on the scene, I told them <coughs> that it had been authorized. You say, when you say on scene, you mean? I, I'm sorry, on scene, at, at the house. All right, and when you say the house, you're, you're talking about 112 East Street in Oxford, correct? Correct. Okay, um, and, and just for the record, did you determine who lived there? I did. And who lived there? Uh, the shooter lived there, uh, James and Jennifer Crumbly lived there as well. Had you met any of those three people before that day? No. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to, to meet uh, Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. Do you see her in the courtroom today? I do. Uh, she's sitting at the defense table with glasses and a gray uh, jacket on. All right. May the records reflect. He's properly identified the defendant. The records will still reflect. Do you remember about what time that you arrived on scene at the house? Uh, I would say it was about 6.30 p.m. Okay. What did you do? Um, the detectives there were already searching the residence. Um, I checked on them, making sure that. Okay, I want to back up because we again we we have to we can't assume. How did they know that the search warrant was authorized? I called and told one of them. Okay, and once you make that call, that then you instruct them to start the search. Yes. Okay. Um, how long do you think that they had been searching by the time you got there? Uh, maybe an hour. Okay. Did you? What did you observe when you arrived? Were, was there anything going on outside or was everything, every, everybody inside? Everybody was inside. There were, I think there was uh, uniform cars outside as security. Uh, okay, did you just have um, individuals from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office or were there other law enforcement agencies? Uh, Brett Brandon from the ATF was there as well. Okay, Special Agent Brandon? Yes. All right. Um, did you have an opportunity to interact with Jennifer Crumbly. I did. Can you tell the jury how that came to be? Um, they were not there uh, when I 
when I first arrived, they ended up showing up, I would say probably about 15 minutes later. Then by they, I mean uh, James and Jennifer. Did, did someone ask them to return to the home? I believe so. And do you know who that was? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Did you ask that they return to the home? I did not. I did not have contact with them prior. Okay. Um, did you want them to return to the home? Yes. Why? Um, they had cell phones in their possession. Okay. In a typical homicide case, do you seize the parents' phones? If I determine that there's relevant information uh, to the homicide investigation, yes. Um, okay. Can you tell the jury why you thought, I assume, was were their phones, did you think they were relevant to the investigation? Yes. And can you tell the jury why? Uh, based on the information I learned at the school, um, I learned that a parent had been there earlier in the day um, with the shooter regarding uh, drawings that were made on an assignment that were disturbing. Um, also, I had learned, or I had observed the shooter's phone um, that had messages that were related to the shooting. And was there a particular message on that screenshot that made you want to search the phone? Yes. What was it? Ethan, don't do it. And who sent that test? Mom, Jennifer okay. Crumley. All right. Uh, can you explain what happened when Jennifer and James Crumbly returned to the home? Um, the search was still ongoing by detectives, so I had them sit in the front living room when they came in. Um, I explained to them the process. Um, they had asked for, James had asked for an itemized list of the, doc, or of the items that were taking, taken out of the home, and I explained to them that we leave a copy of the search warrant, um, the court order authorizing uh, what we were taking, and then we leave. Uh, tabulations basically a receipt, uh, just documenting what items that we had taken. Um, I instructed them that I did need both of their cell phones. Um, and then how did, how did Jennifer react to that? Uh, she did not, she was not happy about that. Um, okay, when you say she wasn't happy, what do you mean? Describe how, what, what that means. She did not want to give me her phone. Um, she seemed irritated about it initially. You know, she was not turning it over. Probably. Did, did I, she say, I'm not giving it to you, or I don't want to give it to you, or, or did she say anything? I don't remember the exact language, um, but it was, I believe it was uh, that she did not want to give it to me. Okay. Um, and then what happened? I explained to her that, you know, it's part of the court order, part of the search warrant, and uh, it was necessary that we collect the cell phone. Um, that's when uh, James interrupted and basically explained to her he's, he's going to get that cell phone one way or another, and might as well just turn it over to him. And then, then she did turn it over. And when you say she turned it over, what does that mean? She, she gave it to you? She handed it to me. Okay. Um, and what did you do next? Um, she was concerned about having phone numbers for, for family members. I allowed her to, I get, took a sheet of paper and I allowed her to write down necessary phone numbers out of there, out, out of her phone. And then um, she I want to back up a bit. Did you, how did you get into the phone? Was it, was she there gave a passcode? me a password. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to make a, a clear record. Was it password protected? I believe it was, yes. Okay, and how did you get the password? She provided the password to me. And can you tell the jury what that inter uh, exchange was like? Um, again, uh, she did not want to give the password. Um, we have the capabilities, obviously, with our computer crimes unit. When we have a search warrant, we can bypass the security. Um, did you explain that to her? I believe I did. Okay. Um, and did you tell her that you were that's what you were going to do if she didn't give the password? Yes. Okay. So did she finally give it to you? Yes. All right. Um, and then you said you you um, allowed her to write down some things. What what did what did she write down? She wrote down some phone numbers and contacts out of her phone. All right. And did you instruct <coughs> the defendants to do anything um, after you seized their phones? Yes. Can you tell the jury what that was? I told them they needed to contact and I, they needed to get, um, she was concerned about being able to call people so I instructed her she could go get a replacement, basically a prepaid phone from a, from a local store and that it was important that we had that number um, that she was to contact either myself or, or Sergeant Joe Bryan. Did you ask them, uh, ask her to do that in a, in a timely way or did, or did you not mention when, when they should provide that? I don't recall specific language, but I, I believe it was important that we had that number that night. I, I don't remember what my wording was, but 
I would say probably no. Okay. Did you are you aware if they did provide those those new phone numbers? They did not provide it to me. Um, I don't know if they provided it to to Sergeant Bryan or not. Okay. Um, what is the protocol when you uh, seize a phone and there's a search warrant to to search the information on a phone? First thing I do is I put it into airplane mode. Um, that way uh, it cannot be remotely wiped. Um, so once we put it in airplane mode, um, it's basically, again, a, pre a preservation um, to prevent the destruction of the information on that phone. Okay. The exchange about the seizing of the phones, um, did you, what did you say in response to that resistance, if anything? Um, I believe I just explained it wasn't an option not to take the phone. It was a court order. Um, and I was trying to be professional about it and say, we're, we're, we're going to take the phone, and I didn't want her to try and resist us taking the phone. Was there any discussion about the students who were injured or killed in that school by the defendant? Not by the defendant, no. Did you say anything about that? Yes. What did you say? Um, I could tell she was kind of frustrated about the situation, the phone, things like that, and I explained Your to her. Your objection to hearsay as to what this officer said? I was his statements are, are what is your objection? <coughs> about my what object, she said to my your client. Objection what said to your client? About what he said to my client. My statement my client's statements are clearly not hearsay. I'm objecting to what he said to my client as hearsay. He he's the declarant. It's not an out of the out of court statement. He's the actual person testifying. Um, and additionally, this is giving context to the exchange at the house with the defendant. Your Honor, there is no I said it exception to hearsay, so even though he's the declarant, there's no I said it exception where he can still testify to hearsay. That's true. Your Honor, I believe that his his statements about what he did during the investigation, uh, which I've elicited several times while he's been um, on the stand, are, are relevant to show what he did and, what, and why he did it. Just because there have been things that I have not objected to doesn't mean that I couldn't have objected okay. to. But okay. I'm objecting at this point. It's not legally correct. Okay, so um, I, I guess one question is whether they're being offered for the uh, truth of the matter asserted. Uh, if they are, but, can I respond to that? Yeah, well, let me back up a little bit. She, uh, Ms., the, Mrs. Crumley did not ask you a question about that, about no. what happened, if there are fatalities at the school. Correct. Okay. Okay, go ahead. His statement to Mrs. Crumbly about what happened at the school is not being offered to prove what happened at the school. We've, we've proven that a hundred different ways, unfortunately. It's being offered to show what he did and the response of the defendant. Yeah, that's, I'm going to allow it. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, right? Thank you. Okay. What did you say to the defendant? Um, I told her that um, there were several dead kids and kids that were shot in the school, and this was significant incidents and it was already on uh, the national news, and even the president had addressed it. How did you know that? Um, from seeing the, the news cameras outside and speaking to other people okay. on scene. All right. Was Jennifer Crumbly crying? No. Was Jennifer Crumbly, um, what, what were her mannerisms or gestures at that point? She seemed irritated and, and frustrated. Um, I remember taking notes down and she made a statement to me saying that uh, he, lives were lost today and he's gonna have to suffer. And I found that odd, uh, the way she said it. Why? Um, because she was referring to a person that was her son. Uh, and again, I've been in, involved in multiple homicide investigations where I've talked to relatives and parents that their children had taken lives and normally it was. Your Honor, I'm objecting to the relevance of what other people have said. Obviously her statement is allowed. The detective testified to what she said, but drawing conclusions about what she was thinking as she said it is speculation. Response? He's not drawing conclusions about what she was thinking. Uh, he's drawing conclusions about what 
he was thinking. He said he found it odd, and I'm asking him why. And I think in the course of this investigation, an officer's perceptions about the defendant's statements, and they, they're being odd compared to what he sees in over 100 different homicide investigations are absolutely relevant. Um, in addition, uh, we are proving, our, our burden, as the court instructed the jury, is to prove gross negligence and what a person using ordinary care would have to do to prevent injury or death to somebody else. And her statements and how they compare to any person, reasonable, ordinary person, are definitely relevant. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to continue, I have to argue based on this argument. This detective, who is very experienced, has never investigated a mass shooting at a school. So he does not have awareness of how parents of mass shooters typically respond because this is a first. I don't think he said that. I think he has um, interviewed or had contact with parents whose children have killed people before. So um, to the extent that you're speculating about, um, you, you hadn't met her before this, right? Correct, yes. So, okay, so you can't speculate about what she's thinking, how she's feeling, how she would normally respond. Okay, there's some people that, um, you know, when someone falls, they laugh, which might seem inappropriate, but that's how that person is, right? But to the, to the you can um, testify about, about your experience, um, why you thought it was odd based on your experience in um, interacting with other parents who had uh, children who um, had killed people. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Can you continue with why you thought it was odd? Can you tell the jury? Yes, the, the language of, of suffer struck me as odd. Um, most of my experience as well, you know, even- I want to stop you. What do you mean suffer? <coughs> when did, explain to me what you mean the language of suffer. Said he's going to have to suffer. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, most of the, my experience as well, you know, there's going to be consequences or, you know, we under we understand the severity of the situation that the the choice of words suffer was odd to me. Okay. All right. Nothing further. Thank you. Um, Detective, when you testified about the giving Mrs. Crumbly the search warrant for the phone. Um, it's fair to say, at least to your knowledge, Mrs. Crumbly has never had a search warrant to take her phone away from her, correct? I don't have any knowledge of that. And when she was expressing concerns to you about not having her cell phone, one of those concerns with it was that she would not have phone numbers to people on her contact list. Is that true? Yes, that's why I allowed her to copy her contact list. She also expressed concern that if she didn't have her phone, she would have no way to call people. It's, I guess what I'm saying is that was the only phone of Mrs. Crumbly that you were taking with the search warrant, correct? I'm sorry, you said that was the only phone? And you took one phone from Mrs. Crumbly. Yes. You don't believe she had other cell phones at that time? I, did, I would not know if she did or not. So when you were taking that cell phone, if that was her only phone, it would be fair to say she wouldn't have a phone to use after that. Yes, that's why I suggested she go purchase another phone from a store that was open. You suggested she go and purchase what some people refer to as burner phones or track phones? A prepaid phone, yes. So you can go to a store, buy a prepaid phone, and it'll have a different phone number, correct? Yes. And you advised the Crumbleys in order to have phones, go ahead and buy these phones. I, I suggested, yes, you should buy another phone and provide that number to us. You did allow Mrs. Crumbly to sit down and write contact numbers out so that she could put them in whatever phone she bought? Yes. And you're aware that by that night, the Crumbleys did purchase track phones? And if you're not aware, just let me know. Um, I learned later in the investigation, but I wasn't involved in that part of it. Okay, fair enough. Again, very quickly, you had never met with or had any dealings with Mrs. Crumbly? That's correct. You have never seen
seen her react to anything in life, a pet dying, a person dying, bad news about a job, anything like that. My only encounter with her was at that house. Thank you. I have no further questions. Nothing further. May this witness be excused. Thank you. Who's the next witness? David Hendrick. David, I'm sorry, can you say that? Hendrick? Hendrick, yes, Judge. He's in the hallway. David Hendrick, D A B I D H E N D R I C K. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Sir, are you currently a member with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? I am not. Okay. And uh, were you at one point? I was. How long did you work with the Sheriff's Office? 34 years. Okay. And you recently retired? I did. Congratulations. Thank you. I would like to direct your attention to the days around November the 30th, 2021. Okay. When you retired, what was your rank? Detective Sergeant. In what unit were you assigned to? The Fugitive Apprehension Team. If you could, sir, please tell the jury what is the Fugitive Apprehension Team? It is a uh, team made up of a handful of sheriff's detectives that uh, go out and look for people wanted for felony warrants. Um, we either felony warrants that are issued uh, by the Sheriff's Department or Sheriff's Department cases or other law enforcement agencies in the county that have requested our assistance in locating those individuals. Okay. And as of uh, November of 2021, how long have you been assigned to the Fugit Van Branch team? Four years, I believe. Okay. And did you retire out of that unit? I did. So all told, how long did you spend as a detective sergeant in the Fugitive Apprehension Team? A little over six. Six years? Okay. Now what roles did you have with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office before you were in the Fugitive Team? Prior to that, I was uh, assigned to our Special Investigations Unit for approximately 10 years. And that's the unit that Lieutenant Will Will Willis heads up right now? That is correct. Okay. And what about before that? Uh, prior to that, I was... Uh, Assigned to our auto theft unit for a period of time, um, all those as sergeants. I was also assigned into our auto theft unit as a deputy prior to getting promoted to sergeant, and as a patrol uh, investigator, which is a substation detective. Prior to that, okay, for a few years. And then prior to that, were you on the road as a patrol deputy? I was. In your six years working with the Fugitive Apprehension Team, could you put a number on how many fugitives you've sought? Hundreds. Okay. Several hundred. And that's probably a conservative number? Yes. Now, are you trained to locate someone who does not want to be found? Yes. All right. Now, what are some things that a person might do if they don't want to be located? Leave their, their residence. They often will uh, stop communicating with family, friends, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, what about funds? Yes. Uh, a lot of times they will try to rely on cash. Why is that? It's, I think it's harder to track any type of financial transaction if you're using cash. Okay. Now, as a detective sergeant in the Fugitive Apprehension Team, would it be fair to say that one of the first places you look for someone is at a home of a friend or a family? Friend or family? Yes. Okay. So then would it be wise to not go somewhere where everybody knows who you are? Sure. Now, specifically to the days after the... Well, first of all, do you recall the Oxford High School shooting on November the 30th of 2021? I do. Okay. And were you working at that point? I was not working that day. Okay. So you didn't respond to the shooting scene itself, would that be right? That is correct. But you were with the Fugitive Apprehension Team then? Yes. Okay. Now, in the days 
the day or, or days after the shooting, um, were you asked to locate James and Jennifer Crumley? Yes. And do you recall who tasked you with that assignment? I believe Lieutenant Wills. Okay. Tim Wills right here at the table? Yes. Okay. Do you recall when you were given that assignment? I believe, not 100% positive, I believe it was like the second of the summer. Okay. So the shooting was Tuesday the 30th, Wednesday the 1st would be the following day, then Thursday the 2nd. Um, you think around that day? I believe it was that day. Okay. Now what information did you have at your disposal when you were tasked with this assignment? We had their basic information um, and their address, things of that, vehicles that they drove, things of that nature. Okay. So were you aware that their um, personal cell phones have been seized? I believe we were, yes. Okay. Were you aware that they had obtained track phones? I don't recall if I was aware of that initially. I believe we were, yes. Okay. That's fair. So what's the first thing you do when you, you, what is the first thing you did when you were tasked with this assignment? Assign uh, the different members of my team to go out and check addresses, start looking for vehicles, start checking local hotels, things of that nature. Okay, so when you say check addresses, what sort of addresses? Family addresses, friends, okay. uh, the home address. No. Did you or a member of your team, um, were you able to uncover information that they stayed at a hotel November the 30th, 2021? I believe so, but the specifics of what hotel I don't recall. Okay, that's fair. Um, you said you had the um, uh, James and Jennifer's vehicles identified at that point. Correct. Okay, were you made aware that a vehicle was, was located? Yes. Tell me about that, please. Um, that vehicle was located in the city of Auburn House. Where at the city of Auburn House? At an extended stay hotel. Okay. And do you recall which day it was located? December 2nd. Correct. And what uh, did you... Uh, I misspoke. December 3rd. Okay. So located in the afternoon of December 3rd. Okay. So when you received that information, what did you do? I had everybody respond to that area to set up surveillance on that vehicle check the hotel to see if they were still registered guests there. Okay, and did you come to find out that they had been registered guests but they left that morning? Yes, I'm not sure the exact date they left, but it, it very well could have been that morning. Okay, it's fair to say that they left and they left that vehicle there, is correct. That correct? Okay, so did you have a team member sitting on that vehicle conducting surveillance? Yes. All right. Did they ever return to retrieve that vehicle? No. In do you recall the uh, type of vehicle that was? I do not. If I said Kia, does that sound right to you? That does sound right. Okay. At that point in time, well by that point in time, were you aware that they had obtained the track phones? Yes. Okay. Did you learn at that point in time that they had obtained another set of phones mm -hmm. as well? I don't believe I knew that. Okay. So that would be new information to you? Yes. Now, at the time the Kia was found, um, you said it was the afternoon of, of December the 3rd. That would have been a Friday. You had detectives conducting surveillance? Correct. Okay. And tell us what happened next, please. Well, that was, we sat and watched the vehicle all afternoon and all evening. Of Friday the 3rd? Friday the 3rd. Okay. And it was later in the evening of Friday the 3rd that I was made aware that their other vehicle had been located. And where was that located? In the city of Detroit. Okay. Now prior to um, discovering that their other vehicle was located in the city of Detroit, um, were you aware that James and Jennifer Crumley had been formally charged at noon on Friday the 3rd? I was. Okay. And what did you do with that information? At that point, uh, myself and one of the other detectives uh, went to what we learned as their attorney's office. <coughs> and attempted to locate the vehicle that we had not found yet. And uh, I spoke to uh, their attorney. Okay, and why did you do that? Well, I wanted to make sure that she was aware that a warrant had been issued and introduced myself as the person that was looking for them and try to broker a safe, event-free surrender. Okay, and were you able to do that? I was not.
did the defendant or her husband ever show up at that office? Not the time we were there, no. Okay. Um, and that was Friday, December the 3rd. Do you recall approximately what time you went there? Midday, noonish, okay. around, shortly after noon. And how long was that meeting at Jennifer Crumley's attorney's office? Five, ten minutes. We weren't there very long. All right. What happened next? Uh, we continued to uh, <coughs> do surveillance um, in the area in the event that they did show up back at the office. Um, and then once the car was located, we responded to the, the, the first car being located. Okay. The second, second. So I take it that the Fugitive Apprehension Team does, doesn't just sit and wait when somebody doesn't show up at their attorney's office. So were other steps being taken? Yes. Tell me about that, please. I had uh, several other members of the uh, team checking different addresses, checking hotels, all the things that we would normally do, continually okay. looking. Okay. And were you working with other law enforcement agencies at this point in time? There were other law enforcement agencies that were offering their help and they were actively looking in their areas as well. Okay, and what agencies were those? Uh, I believe the uh, U.S. Marshals, the Border Patrol, um, I have received calls from the ATF, um, I know the, uh, I believe the state police were looking, the Detroit police were looking, everybody in the general area was looking for the vehicle that was still unaccounted for. Okay. And is that something that typically happens in a um, fugitive situation? Depends on the case. Um, one of this magnitude, yes, that information uh, would have been put out as a, uh, be on the lookout for that vehicle. Okay. So as the detective sergeant um, in the fugitive team, you were the one fielding these offers for assistance? Yes. Okay. So, uh, sir, at this point in time, you have been tasked with this assignment by Lieutenant Willis. Is that correct? Correct. So, who do you apprise of progress in a fugitive <coughs> situation? Uh, in this particular case, I was apprising Lieutenant Willis uh, and also uh, Under Sheriff McCabe. Okay. He was calling me for regular update. And that's wholly a law enforcement function, would that be correct? Yes. Okay, as in the Sheriff's Office or if the Border Patrol or FBI or ATF were working with you? Yes. Now, after you had the detective sitting in Auburn Hills, and after you had been conducting surveillance at Jennifer Crumbly's attorney's office, do you recall what city that was? Uh, Blunka Township, I believe. Okay. Um, what, you said you were notified of the vehicle being found in Detroit. <coughs> yes. Okay, do you recall the approximate time that occurred? I think it was close to 11 p.m., maybe shortly before 11 p.m. Okay. Um, if I told you that the charges were formally read on noon on Friday the 3rd, would that sound correct? Yeah. So tell me what happened when you received that information that another vehicle, the Crumleys, was located in Detroit. Um, at that point, I instructed uh, one of my detectives to maintain contact with the vehicle that we had found earlier in the day, and then I pulled everybody else and we headed toward the address in Detroit. Okay. When you see when you say everybody else, were people doing different things in different locations? Yes. I mean, several of the guys were right there on the car because that was the one thing that we knew we had. So okay. we were sitting there. So yes, I pulled everybody off of that location and any other tasks that they were doing to head to Detroit. Okay. What other tasks were other detectives doing if they weren't conducting surveillance? Uh, just searching records, looking looking for anything they could find that might lead us somewhere else. Okay. How many members, if you can tell us approximately, are in the Fugitive Apprehension Team? At that time, I believe we had seven. Okay. And we're all seven detectives assigned to this task? Yes. All right. Did you learn the address of the building where that uh, second vehicle was found? I did. Okay. So I said 1111 Bellevue Street in Detroit. Does that sound right to you? That sounds correct. Now give us an idea of where that is in the city of Detroit? It would be, um, I guess, on the, the east side of Detroit near Belle Isle, uh, just a couple blocks 
in from, from Jefferson there, which is the main drag that runs along there. Okay, so close, so we're oriented near the Detroit River? Yes. Okay. And what's, what's at that location? Uh, that is an industrial building um, that it was multiple floors and had multiple different suites or um, rooms in it. Okay. Um, tell me your observation when you arrived at that location. When we first arrived, the Detroit Police Department was there. Uh, they had the vehicle um, blocked off so it, nobody could get in or out of the parking lot. It was the only vehicle I recall being in the parking lot. Um, and there were several Detroit officers on scene at that point. When we say several officers, are we talking about five or six, or are we talking about more of that? More than that. So give us an idea of how many officers were on scene. At that particular point, when we arrived there, there was probably 15, 20. Okay. And did additional law enforcement personnel arrive as the night wore on? They did. Okay. And all told, could you give us an idea of how many police or federal agents were there on scene? I'm guessing by the end of the night, there were probably uh, around 100, I'm okay. guessing. And we say the end of the night, did the night end with the apprehension of the defendant? It did as far as my team was concerned, Okay. Yes. So by that point in time, there were over 100 law enforcement personnel on scene? I would estimate. All right. So you said you recall uh, being notified that the second vehicle was located in Detroit around 11 p.m. on Friday the 3rd? I believe shortly before 11, but around 11. Do you recall about what time you arrived there? We got down there pretty quick that hour and night, probably 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, and so we're talking about 11, 10, 11, 15 ish. And I don't want to guess, so just tell me if that sounds or, right. Or a little bit earlier. Or a little bit earlier, okay. And there were already about 15 or so at least officers on scene? Yes. All right. <clears throat> so once you arrived on scene, did you coordinate with other officers? Yes, I talked to uh, the whoever was in charge, the sergeant or the lieutenant, I'm not sure what he ran for. Okay. The police department that was there. And then was a plan, plan formed to search that industrial building? Yes. Tell me about that. Uh, as more officers arrived, uh, we were able to gain access to the building and we kind of formulated a plan that several of us would search the second and I believe third floor of the building and the um, Detroit Police Department was going to search, their SWAT team was going to search the first floor. Okay. And sir, you've been a part of searches for fugitives in buildings in the past, I take it? Yes. Okay. Give us an idea of what that looks like. Uh, it's a very slow, methodical process. Um, you slowly approach every door. You uh, do your best to make sure that obviously no one gets hurt inside or outside. You make entry in, and then you search every place inside of the room you're in that could possibly hold an individual. Okay. Is this a quiet endeavor, or is noise made? Uh, it can be quite noisy. Okay. Yes. And it's quite no noisy the night of December the 3rd, 2021? Yes, it was very noisy. Okay. So you had, um, I think you said seven detectives at your disposal in your, your particular team? Yes. Okay. Um, and there were other teams conducting searches at the same time? Yes. So each team was, was searching different areas of the building, would that be right? Yes, we searched. Each team kind of res was responsible for a certain floor of the building. Okay. And were there police vehicles on the perimeter of this building? Yes. Okay. Can you give us an idea of how many police vehicles you saw? Dozens. Now, sir, did you subsequently learn that an acquaintance of the defendant, Jennifer Crumbly, had a studio in that industrial building? I learned that at some point, yes. Okay. So you weren't involved in the actual apprehension of the defendant or her husband, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And tell us, if you know, how the apprehension occurred. I believe that when the Detroit police SWAT team searched that room, they were located inside of that room. Okay, and um, if, do you recall the time that that, that occurred where they, where they were found? Approximately one o'clock in the morning, I would think. Okay, Somewhere so that'd be there. Friday, I'm sorry, Saturday, December the 4th? Yes. After they were apprehended, were they turned over to you? Yes. Okay, and then what happened? Uh, we 
myself um, and uh, two other officers transported them directly back to the sheriff's office. Okay. They they were in each of their vehicles and I was following. Okay. And just so the record is clear, um, do you see Jennifer Crumley in court today? I do. Can you please point her to describe something she's wearing today? A gray uh, blazer. Would the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Jennifer? The record would reflect the correct identification of the defendant. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you. Good af uh, morning, afternoon. Good morning. Um, you have obviously a lot of experience uh, with law enforcement, correct? In addition to your position um, where you're tasked with tracking down fugitives, you also have additional experience as a police officer who has arrested people in the past, correct? Yeah. And there are different ways that a person accused of a crime can come into into custody of the sheriff's department. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay, so <coughs> if you see a crime take place, you can immediately go and arrest that person upon seeing a crime take place. Yes. You have the ability to go to the court present facts and ask the court to sign an arrest warrant. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Now if an arrest warrant is issued and outstanding, if a police officer were to pull someone over for a traffic stop that had a warrant, they could be taken into custody at that point. Yes. And that has happened before, where during a routine traffic stop, you see, oh my gosh, this person has a warrant. Yes? Yes. It's also possible when warrants are issued that there are arrangements and you're not a part of this. The defense attorney and the prosecutor can make arrangements for the defendant to turn themselves in to the court. I can't speak to arrangements that would be made between the attorneys. It's possible though for arrangements to be made that you, you're not a part of making, correct? Yeah, I would have possibly, yes. There are people who, when they have an outstanding <coughs> arrest warrant, show up to the court to get a, what's called arraigned on the warrant. Yes. Now, on, you testified, and I think at one point you said you were sort of watching the vehicle, the Kia, on December 2nd. Was that, in, was that incorrect or was it December 3rd? It was December 3rd. Okay, so on December 3rd, you began watching the Kia at, that was in the hotel parking lot at what time? Mid, midday, I, I don't recall the exact time. So you began watching the, the vehicle, the Kia, midday, and you never saw either of the Crumbleys return to that Kia, correct? Correct. It was midday on the 3rd that the prosecutor's office announced there was a warrant out for Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly. Correct. And on that day, you did not speak with Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly. They did not make any statements to you, correct? Correct. You testified that you stopped by an attorney's office. It's fair to say that was my office. That's correct. And we met very briefly, actually, in the hallway of my office. Correct. And during that meeting, I told you I am trying to make arrangements for my client with the prosecutor. Judge, I have to object. Counsel can't be a lawyer and a witness. The court has talked about this as early as March of 2022. Right. We have a I'll waiver. I'm sorry. Right. I'll right. withdraw the question. Okay. If there were any arrangements being made between a lawyer and the prosecutor, you are not aware of those arrangements, correct? Correct. Do you pay attention if the lawyer files an appearance with the court, letting the court know Mrs. Crumbly has a lawyer? Not typically, no. So you would not be aware if Mrs. Crumbly had hired, officially hired a lawyer, and they filed an appearance saying, I'm representing Mrs. Crumbly? Normally, no. So that night, you testified that ultimately, you ended up over in Detroit where the other vehicle of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly was found. Correct. Now, when the other vehicle of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly was found, you have no idea how that vehicle got to Detroit. 
Correct. You have no idea if Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly rode in the car together or if one of them drove that vehicle there. Correct. You also have no idea why they may have left a vehicle at the hotel in Auburn Hills, correct? Correct. And knowing that they stayed at a hotel in Auburn Hills, we can agree that Auburn Hills is close to this courthouse. Correct. Auburn Hills is located in between, essentially, this courthouse and Oxford. Is that a fair statement? And I don't know the geography real well, even though I live there. You could say that. Okay. So we know that one of their vehicles is local in Auburn Hills, correct? Correct. And the location in Detroit is less than an hour from here. Correct. Now, when you went to that building uh, where Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were ultimately found, that building you described as an industrial building, correct? Yes. You testified that there are multiple suites within the building. Yes. And there are, it's fair to say there are several businesses that operate out of that building. Yes. It is not an abandoned building. No. It is not an abandoned warehouse. No. So if there were ever comments made that Mrs. Crumbly was found in an abandoned warehouse, that was simply incorrect. It was not an abandoned warehouse. Correct. Your testimony was that at approximately 1 o'clock a.m. on the 4th, so later that night, that was specifically when Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were located in that building, correct? Correct. And to your knowledge, they were found in an art studio that where a business um, had an operating art studio. I'm not sure what actually was in the studio. I never actually entered the studio. You, the portion of the building that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were in was not some abandoned, uh, barred up area of the building that was vacant. Correct. So there was a business or something going on in that studio. Um, it's, I just want to make it clear that it wasn't something that was abandoned um, where no one was going or using um, over, over time prior to that day. I don't know what took place in that studio. I never entered that studio, but I do not believe it was an abandoned studio. So they were ultimately apprehended around 1 o'clock in the morning. Correct. And do you have knowledge, and if you're not the right witness, please let me know, of what Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were doing when they were apprehended at 1 o'clock in the morning? I have no idea. I thank was not you. in the room. Okay, thank you. Matt? Sure. Um, sir, the fugitive apprehension team, your function is to find the fugitive. Would that be right? That's correct. Okay. Um, and this is a law enforcement function. Yes. Okay. And you were given your directives by Lieutenant Tim Willis of the Special Investigative Unit? Yes, sir. He's the officer in charge of this investigation? Yes. Okay. Um, now, the rooms that you cleared, they weren't homes, apartments, or lofts, correct? No. Okay. No. Thank you. Nothing further. All right, you may step down in your excuse. Your Honor, can we have a quick bathroom break? Um, sure. About 10, ten minutes. Okay. All right, for the jury.
People v. Jennifer Crumbly, case number Swear or affirm the testimony about together the truth to help you back. Yes. Wait, right, you can be seated. <coughs> and then would you state the name and spell your first and last name? Sure. Uh, so name is Luke Kirtley. L U K E K I R T L E Y. Do you want to play some? Is it K I R T L Y? K I R T L E Y. Okay, go ahead. I want to place on the record that Mr. Kirtley doesn't mean any disrespect. He has a sensitivity to his eyes, so he's been given permission to have his. to. Um, to wear his uh, hat, yeah, that's so the jury doesn't think he's being disrespectful. Okay, um, may I call you Luke? Yes. Okay. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are okay. you? Um, can you tell the jury what your um, occupation is? What do you do for a living? Sure. Um, I own a company called Coffee Hub um, in Detroit, and so we uh, you know, manufacture and roast coffee and supply coffee to restaurants, hotels, um, and own a couple of cafes as well. All right. And when did you start that business? Um, so I, I registered the business in about 2017, um, moved into Bellevue, um, I would say about two years after that. In our current spot, we were there since 2020. Okay. Um, just briefly, what do you what do you need space for in your business? What are you, what are you doing in your actual um, Brick and mortar. Sure. So, uh, as of current, we have two spaces in the building. Um, one space is on the first floor, which is where we manufacture uh, the coffee. So, we import it, uh, we bring it in on trucks, we do all the roasting there, um, and just, you know, packaging, everything like that. And our offices are down there as well. And then on the third floor, um, we just have storage. All right. Um, and the address of that building is what? 1111 Bellevue Street. All right. How, how long have you been a tenant there? Um, so I've been in the current space since 2020. Um, maybe a year before that, I was in another space on the third floor. All right. Uh, 
Are there any conditions in your lease about what you can do um, with that building in terms of what you can use it for? Definitely, yeah, I think there's uh, general terms and conditions that you define within the lease, um, you know, to, to my knowledge, um, what I've seen. Can, there, can you have um, a business that has people um, residing there overnight? No, uh, at least in my specific lease, um, you're not allowed to sleep there at all. All right, um, can you describe to the jury, aside from the address, about where that building is in Detroit? Sure, uh, so it's generally when, I, when people ask me where my office is, I tell them it's right across from Belle Isle. Um, so, you know, Island in Detroit, we're about two blocks off of Jefferson, which is a pretty fairly main road, uh, Jefferson and East Grand Boulevard. Specifically, this is Bellevue between Lafayette and St. Paul. Okay. Um, and about how many other tenants, if you know approximately, are in that building? I would say in terms of leaseholders, maybe 10. Okay. Um, is there anything else significant about that building with regard to storage? Is there parking? Uh, yeah, so uh, in general, um, where maybe, you know, employees and tenants of the building park are on the street, uh, which is just free open parking, and then there's two parking lots. There's a, uh, I don't know, north or west, north or south or east or west, but um, on one side of the building, there's a parking lot, which is uh, gated, you know, you have like a little clicker to get in, and then on the other side, there's a strip of guest parking that they identify, and then the same thing, kind of like a remote uh, sliding gate. And so who has the, the, the fob or the remote to get into the parking lot? Uh, tenants. Okay. Um, is there any in indoor parking or garage? Uh, so there are indoor garages. Um, there's a couple different spots. There's one side of the building on the, if we're looking at the front of the building on the left, there's an, uh, essentially like an, an empty part of the building that hasn't been developed yet um, that they store like a truck when they spread salt and whatnot. That sits in there. Um, and then there's a main garage door, uh, which ten tenants use actively to go in and out of um, for loading and unloading. Okay. Um, and then on the on the first floor, there's an elevator that you can drive a car onto and go up and down through the floors. Okay. And what would you what would be the reason you have to you need a car elevator? Uh, well, so the building was um, for like car manufacturing in the 20s. Okay. Um, so or it was there. It's the original elevator from when the building was built. Um, but tenants like myself and um, a, a woodworking company on the second floor will use it to move cars up and down, load, unload generally. All right. So in addition to your coffee roasting business, you, you, you have a, another hobby, is that yeah, correct? That's correct. All right. And what is that? Tell um, the jury so what it is. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I like to drive cars, um, but you know, I cycle through, sell, buy um, cars just to enjoy. And so um, presumably... Where you're getting at is on the third floor. Um, you know, I put cars up there every now and then. We have one of the storage units has a garage door ourselves, so we can pull a car in there. For so, storage. at any given time, how many cars <coughs> do you have personally? Two or three. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I want to take you back to uh, November 30th of 2021. Um, how many cars did you own at that time, if you can remember? I believe two. Uh, it might have been three, but as far as I know, it wasn't that many. All right. And did you have a reason, um, that was a Tuesday, Were, did you work that day during the day? Yes. And about what time did you leave? Uh, not sure exactly. I, you know, being a business owner, I work really random hours, um, so sometimes late, sometimes early, but generally speaking, I get off around six-ish. Okay. Uh, talk to me about activity. Have you been there at, at night past 10 o'clock before? Yeah. Um, what is the, what is, what's the... The, the building occupied around that time? Do you have people that are still in the building working? Very rarely. Um, so there's like, there's one tenant to my left, um, which is like a breed rare plants, uh, to my knowledge. Um, they are intermittently there late. Um, it's not a pattern, I would say, if anything. So they're just kind of there. Um, and then there's a vinyl sign uh, company as well. The owner's often there late, but not, I wouldn't say he makes like a, a particular habit of being there at a certain time, but generally speaking, when I go there, uh, to, like switch cars around or anything, it's uh, empty. Okay, um, let's back up the switching car things. Explain to yeah, the jury okay. what you mean. So I, um, at the time, I lived down the street, uh, more or less, you know, less than a mile away, and where I would park my car, um, I found it as a liability to park uh, one of the cars there because it was like a nicer, lower mile car, because my other one had its mirror taken off. Um, on the street that I park on, 
so when I have a like what you, people refer to as like a daily driver, that's what I let sit at the building while I you know went and enjoyed my other car. Mm -hmm. And then when yeah, it was I can't time, personally relate to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it was time to put it away, um, I went and got my my worst car generally, you know, and uh, went to go park that on the street. And so I, I took the car. You have a beater. Yes, I, a beater. <laughs> exactly really right. Beater. You should have seen the oil that came out of that thing. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, I had a, a beater, you could say. Um, and then the other one was a little nicer, um, and I had plans to sell it, so I put it at the office to avoid, um, you know, something like that. Happening. Okay, so you decided to go take that car and and basically switch cars. That's correct. Right. And and you did that at what time? If you remember. Uh, around 10 p.m., I would say. Okay. Um, <coughs> did you live with anybody at the time? Uh, my girlfriend. Okay. So, now fiancé, uh, she's nice, but um, she, and she's always like, oh, it's so late, just leave it, it's fine, and, but I'm just always like obsessed, so I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm just going to switch it really quick. Because you didn't want anything to happen to it. Correct. Okay. So, um, <coughs> when you went to the building around 10 o'clock that night, mm -hmm. What, if anything, did you know about Jennifer Crumley? So, obviously I was uh, relatively in tune with what had happened at the school. So I knew of that news, um, and I had heard through Facebook, I saw it, I don't know what or who posted it, but it was some type of like um, poster, you know, that was like, hey, this is like the car, this is like the situation, everything like that. What, what, is, what, what was on the poster? The car and the license plate, and presumably any photos or anything like that. Okay, so I, I need you to kind of be specific when yes. you say the car and photos. Uh -huh. Were there any people pictured in the photos? Um, I believe so. And do you know who that was? Um, I, well, it was the, the two parents. <coughs> okay, the Crumbleys. Mm -hmm. All right, and then there's a picture. there were pictures of cars? Yeah, there was a picture of, uh, it was like a stock photo of a Kia, um, and it was a newer Kia that I've never <laughs> seen before. <laughs> So I kind of, you know, kind of remember that, and then there was a license plate as well. Okay. Um, what did the poster say? A lot. Were there any words? Uh, yeah. I mean, I assume it. I, you know, it was years ago at the time, but I assume it would have said wanted, and then additional information um, about the whereabouts, anything like that. But okay. just really, to my knowledge, you know, like all I really remember of it is the car the and the license plate. Okay. All right. So tell the jury what happened. As you approach the building, what's the first thing you did? You have to use the clicker. Yeah, so um, I used the clicker, and I don't know how far you want me to go, uh, but I used the clicker, uh, pulled my car into the parking lot where I, you know, I normally park my car, and then at the time I noticed a car was parked in the back corner of the lot, you know, like tucked away, but I didn't really pay any mind to it. We have cars, you know, many tenants in the building with different cars, and employees leave cars every now and then. Uh, but I feel like I'm pretty in tune with uh, who keeps their cars there and just generally observant. And so I saw the car, didn't really think much of it, um, went inside to my office, and then when I walked back out of the door, that's kind of when I was in line of sight of the front of the car, and that's when... Okay, so the, the car was wasn't, yeah. the car was in, um, was backed in, or was it parked front first? Uh, no, so it was backed into the, uh, you know, the furthest corner of the lot. Okay. Uh, Were there any other cars in the lot? I don't, there may have been one car in there that wasn't my own, um, but I wasn't sure, I'm not sure if that's it, but I do know there's one car that generally sits there. Was it the closest spot <coughs> to the building or the, or the furthest away? It was the, so if you're standing in the front of the building, it was the furthest spot you could park possible. Okay. And, um, I'm sorry, I, I said November 30th. Um, and I, I, I apologize, it wasn't November 30th. I was asking, did you know what happened on November 30th? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. What was the day, though, that you went to the, um, at 10 o'clock to switch the cars? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Whatever day. The was, it a, was it a Friday? I, I'm not. Okay, but if, if I told you it was December 3rd, do you have reason to believe that was incorrect? Not particularly. Okay. I think, it, I mean, I remember it being very cold out. Okay, so. okay. Thank you, Mr. Keys, for reminding me of that. Um, so, you came back out, and you saw, did you say you saw the car again? Yeah, so when I opened the door, the side door of the building and walked out, I was met more in the line of sight with the front of the car, since it was back into the spot. 
Um, what did you think, if anything? Um, really, I just thought it looked a little familiar, and it, it you know, rung a bell. And it was the car that I saw on the poster. How soon in time to the the, the wanted poster, as you describe it, um, did you see that car? Uh, it was the same day. Okay. All right. So, what did you do next? Um, so I saw the car, uh, but obviously it was backed into so the plate, which I thought was peculiar, uh, just because it was a newer car and I hadn't seen it before. Um, so. I pulled up on my phone the poster I found it. Hold on. And, and uh, um, I think you're hearing people next door. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. okay so um, you pulled up the poster on your phone. So I found the poster, um, and I was doing this as I was walking to the car. Um, and by the time I had the poster up, I was I turned my flashlight on and walked around the back of the car uh, on that driver's side to the back, and then obviously put two and two together that that was the plate that was on the. Poster. So the license plate, did the license plate match what was on the poster? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what happened? Um, and then, so I, so I looked over um, and saw somebody sitting next to the car on a curb. So there's like a general curb. Um, saw somebody sitting there. Um, on, the, on the driver's side? On the passenger side. Rear passenger side, there's like an elevated curb that you could sit on. probably two feet tall. Okay. And um, somebody was sitting there. Um, put up in like a blue plaid hoodie, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't like, oh. Uh, Did you say anything? I didn't say anything. Um, as you approach the car and it's facing you, correct, the front of it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> did you see any figure on um, on the passenger side no. wheel? Okay. No. Um, it was also dark. Okay. Um, was there a line of sight? For instance, if when you turned around and you from the back of the 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 passenger, could you see in front of you, or was there something obstructing that? Uh, no, it was a pretty clear, straight shot. As to whether or not uh, we would have been able to make eye contact in theory, I'm not 100% positive, uh, okay. just based off of like the angle of where the door and the car is. Um, but would, I you, would it be, um, if, if you were standing where that person was sitting, would you have been able to see somebody approaching the car? If I was standing, then yes. If I was sitting, I'm not 100% positive. Okay. So, did that figure in the hoodie move? Uh, no. Did that individual turn around and respond to your flashlight? No. Did, did that individual say anything? No. Did you notice anything else? Do you know what the individual was doing? No. Okay. Um, what did you do next? Uh, turned my flashlight off and very calmly walked back into the building as if I didn't see anybody. Why did you do that? Because, um, I assumed after connecting that it was uh, the plate that it was somebody uh, related to the incident. Okay, and how are you feeling in that moment? Uh, quite tense. I, I remember specifically putting the plate two and two together. It's like that's a, that's a feeling you've never felt before. Okay. Uh, but so then I walked back into my office um, okay. and I locked all the doors. Were you afraid? Uh, I would say so, yeah. I, I wasn't aware of, I mean, it was a, a lot of emotions were going on at the time. Okay. Um, <coughs> is the building equipped with um, a CCTV? Uh, as far as I know, they have cameras, um, and they've used them before um, in other, you know, there was, a, there was a theft in that building once. Okay, so you are you aware of where the cameras are placed? Generally. Okay. Uh, and there's one in the parking lot that we're talking about right now. And then there's a few in there which I would consider like the main promenade of the building inside. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to view that footage in the night? Uh, that night? No, I have not. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, it is People's um, 344. Their phone. Oh, who dropped the phone? Okay. Your Honor, we. The defense stipulates to the admission of 344. Thank you. All right. Uh, if you, you can see on your monitor yeah. there. Um, we're going to. What are we looking at? Okay, so this is um, a camera from the, the rear of the building. I actually didn't know that we had a camera here. Um, okay. There's another camera, which in this, there's um, that trash, like in a receptacle back there in the top right corner. Okay. Uh, there's another camera there. All right. So. Um, what's up on the right corner, top of the page? What is that? That's uh, like a dumpster. 
Okay. Uh, so it's like a removable dumpster. And where in relation to this photo would the entrance or exit be? Right to the left of it. So if you are looking generally like, yeah, that is the gate that you're pulling to. Okay. So this is looking at the building. Uh, this is this is a, this is on the building. The okay. camera itself, looking away from the building. So that's where what you just what we just pointed to is where you would enter the parking lot. Correct. Where the clicker. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. And um, then the the actual door is uh, you know, to the right here. Yeah, right, right over there. Okay. For the record, Your Honor, the, the timestamp is 22 minutes off. It seems to be a running theme with all surveillance. Um, so um, that would be what time would one moment, Your Honor? Isn't this um, 10:56? It's not 10:56. Up on the screen is 22 minutes fast than actual time. Okay. Um, we're going to establish the time of the 911 call, which might help put this in, in better perspective. At some point, you called 911, correct? Yes. Was it how long of a time period was it um, from seeing the individual and recognizing it was the same car to calling 911? Maybe a minute or two. Okay. Uh -huh. So your call to 911 was around 10:43 that night. Okay. Um, so, um, you just, a, a few minutes before that, is that correct? Definitely, yeah, okay. I went right into my office and called them with you. Okay, and so then. <coughs> okay, so I believe that's around 10.34 that this footage is from, um, but we clear that, and um, we're gonna play that. Parking spot um, is that? How close to the entrance of the building is it? Uh, it's I'm parked right next to the door. Okay. And the place where you saw this Kia and we saw an individual walking towards the left, um, where where would that car? I, we can't see it, but where would it be parked in relation to this um, screen? So where is their car? Yes. Uh, in the bottom left, right there. Okay. So at the top, do you see what you? Can you tell the jury what you're doing? Uh, going into the building, looks like. Okay. Uh, you can see me look over at the car, too, right there for the first time. Also, just for the record, I don't know if this is my BMW or the Volkswagen, but I know I had those two at the time. <coughs> and they both have roof racks, unfortunately. When you enter the building, then do you have to go into another um, door to get to your unit? Yeah, I have to go through to my main office. So. Okay, so can you tell the jury what you're doing right there? So that this is where I'm uh, walking over to check that plate. Um, and what do you have in your hand? My phone. <laughs> Okay. 
said he's, he was playing it cool. And what do you see there? Uh, so this obviously I didn't know of or see at the time, but um, the person that I saw going into the building, looked, I mean, looks like. Almost right after. Directly after, yeah. Did you see that person? When I, you was, I must have been in my unit at the time because I did not know anybody came into the building. <coughs> okay. Did you know until now that that happened? Uh, I did know um, that at the, I put it together that they got in this building somehow. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, there's a car at the top entering the, the parking lot. Um, how long did you stay in your unit? Um, until they arrived, and then I came out of the front of the building. Okay. Which um, my door, the front door to my uh, entrance is like right where they are, basically. Because this whole uh, wall on the right side, mm -hmm. all of those are, um, that's my whole unit. Okay. From basically, uh, I would say, the end of um, the, the other unit, you know, the artist's unit, all the way down to the corner of the building. Okay. It might be a good time to talk about that. Um, do you know a person um, whose last name is Sakura? Yes. All right. How do you know him? Uh, I know he's a tenant in the building. Have you ever spent time talking to him? Are you friends? No, I've uh, you know we've waved to each other before. Okay. But um, more than that, nothing. I didn't know anything about him, and uh, yeah, that was, that was the extent of our relationship. Okay. And um, did you? Ever um, around this time, was there anything significant about the the hallway on the first floor? Um, was there anything left there? Um, well, so tenants will leave things every now and then. Um, at the time, there was a, in the central promenade, which is like generally where people pull into the elevator and whatnot. Um, there was a mattress sitting. There. Can you describe the mattress? Uh, it was a white mattress. Um, I think it had like an orange stripe on it, uh, not positive, but I think it was a temper feed as well. Okay, um, was that normal to have a mattress just hanging out in the <coughs> promenade? Okay, um, how long was it there? Um, a few days maybe, maybe a week. Um, could have been there longer. I know it was there long enough for somebody to put a note on it and to ask <coughs> if it was like being thrown out um, and if they could buy it or use it or something, but somebody put a note on it okay. at some point. All right. Um, and the, when you walked back into the building that night, um, at some point did you notice that that mattress was no longer in, in that promenade area? Uh, I probably didn't pay any particular mind to it, but, uh, I, it was <coughs> The next day? Yeah, did you see, did you notice that, or that night, or? Well, I, I assume I could have noticed at the time, but I don't recall if I particularly, uh, remember if the mattress was there. Obviously, my mind was on a little on something else at this point. Right. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to play for you. At some point, you call 911. Yes. Said. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play for you the 911 call. You have listened to that before. Yes. Okay. It's exhibit 345. Any? Of, I'm not sure if there's an objection to it. I'm sorry. We stipulate to the admission of 345. Thank you. Thank you. Can't it. Thank you. Okay. We're going to play. Call on Friday, December 3rd. 
think they were at all involved in entering the building or not, I would have thought that they, because uh, they just asked me what I think, and I was like, they definitely would have taken off. Okay. Um, so they had, you know, essentially a perimeter. I was standing with an officer, and he was like, oh, yeah, you know, like we're scouting out the, the surroundings and whatnot. So I, at the time, if you would have asked me if they were in the building, I would have told you 100% no way. But you didn't see them go anywhere? Nope. You just thought they would be running? Yeah, I just, I didn't think there was a situation where they would have been able to access the building without the fob. I see. Um, at some point, the Crumbies were apprehended. Were you there? Uh, I was at the command center thing that I uh, described earlier at the time. Okay, so did you observe searches just in the house, or were you aware that there was searching going on in the in the area? Uh, no, I was just I mean I was just aware that there were searches going on in the, the office building. Okay, and did you return to your office that night? Uh, well, I had to get my car. I don't know if I entered my office afterwards. Okay. Do you? Oh wait, I did walk into the office because I was walking with um, officers. All right. Do you know if that was before or after they were apprehended? That was after. I was not there. Um, during the apprehension, uh, the one of the officers when we were sitting at the command center was like, "Here they go," and then uh, took me to the office. And can did you recognize anything about either one of the individuals? Uh, I never saw the individuals. Okay. Uh -huh. I only okay. saw a, a car, a squad car leave. Okay, I mm -hmm. appreciate that. Um, do you remember what time you that was, or when you arrived home that night? Late, uh, maybe two or three. A.M. In the morning? It was a couple hours, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, did that mattress reappear? Yes. Uh, so afterwards, I don't know if it was the same day or like, you know, the following day, but the mattress was back into the hallway and there was a bit of a tangle as to what happened with it after. Um, somebody had placed it like in front of the artist's door at a time, and then it got moved back to the center and kind of went back and forth because I, I don't know whose it was, um, but I assume they didn't want it after uh, what had happened. So I don't know where it is now, uh, but it was it was generally floating around the office uh, building for a couple days afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Your business is in that building, is that correct? That's correct. And there are other businesses in that building. Yes. It is not in any way, shape, or form an abandoned building. That's correct. Now, you were testifying about how you have cars um, that you store in the building. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And I'm sorry, the judge is making, the court has to make a clear record of yes sure. or no, so they can't record mm -hmm. okay. But I knew it was. Yeah. Okay. So, you have <coughs> cars that you don't want people to see um, that occasionally you have over at your place of business, correct? That's correct. So at night, if you have a nice car, you actually put it into the building so that people out in the parking lot can't just see it out and about. Yes, though I would say I'm very particular about my cars. I would say that generally uh, people don't think like that. Okay, but if you're if you're thinking like that and you want to make sure people don't see your cars, mm -hmm. you know if you put them in the building, they're safer. That's correct. It's in my um, my unit specifically, so I have a garage unit um, that I pull the car into because the technically it's still in public view uh, by the other tenants. If I were to just park the car, and we aren't allowed to park our car in this space generally, uh, I only use it for my specific <coughs> unit. Okay, I see. And on that date, it's fair to say no one asks you, hey, can somebody put their car in your private space in the building, correct? Correct. Now, you testified that when you saw the person out in the parking lot, they were sitting outside of their car. Is that correct? Yes. And when you even walked over with your flashlight, mm -hmm. that person didn't get up and run away, anything like that, correct? Correct. Could you tell what that person was doing? No. Just if sitting. I if I told you they were smoking cigarettes, do you recall seeing that? No. So they stayed sitting even when they saw you with the flashlight out there. That's correct. And after they saw you with the flashlight, we saw in the video, you went back in playing it cool, correct? Yes. 
and that person appears to have walked back into the building as well. Yes. You weren't aware that they walked back in the building, but we can see now on the tape that that's what happened. Correct. And you testified that when you could see the person out by the car, um, they could see, they could also see you, correct? Not particularly. Um, there, if they were sitting behind the car, um, like I mentioned, there's a chance they couldn't have met direct eye contact with me coming out of the building. So they may have seen you or may not have. Correct. Now, you testified, too, that <coughs> when this was all unfolding, you put yourself in the most secure spot in your space, in your tenant space, correct? Yes. You went into your office and felt like you needed to hide out in the most safe place you could find. I wanted to be as far away from my doors as possible, given the the instance somebody perhaps would enter or hear me or anything. And from what you knew about this case, there is this statewide manhunt for Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly. Uh, that's correct. And from what you knew, it appeared that law enforcement, the marshals, the border patrol, sheriff's department, law enforcement around the state are looking for the Crumblies, correct? I would say my extent of who was looking for them was only to the actual poster that I saw. Okay. I wasn't particularly familiar with the gravity of the situation. You were familiar that it was important, though, because you, when you saw them, you obviously knew, I need to call 911 That's and make correct. sure to report this. Yes. And if anything, you were, you were shocked that you ended up seeing their vehicle at your, at your place of business. Yes. Now, when you saw people coming, you testified that a lot of uh, law enforcement came in with lots of guns. Is that correct? After identifying the car. After uh, identifying the car. <coughs> firstly, just a, an officer or two showed up. Okay, so an officer or two showed up. Did mm -hmm. they have guns? No. Okay, when, I mean, when were there lots of I guns? I assume they did have a you know, handgun. Yeah. Uh, as, officers are, as officers do. Though, um, I wouldn't see the arrival of people with any uh, rifles or anything like that um, until after that was confirmed. Okay, so after law enforcement got there is when you see uh, law enforcement coming in with rifles, guns, vests, things like that. Yes. Now, the cameras you testified about on the outside of the building, there was one camera that you said, oh, I didn't even know we had a camera there. Do you recall testifying to that? Yes. There are many other cameras on the outside of the building that are visible to anyone in the parking lot, correct? Yes, I would say they're not uh, you know, uh, out there like you would be like, oh, look at those cameras. But it, there are cameras there. If you look around, you'll find them. So if you're in the parking lot and you look at the building, you can see that there's different cameras on the building? Yes. And there's, there's a number of cameras on the building? There are, so including this one, there are two on that side of the parking lot. Uh, two small white cameras, and then um, perhaps one on the front. I don't know if there are any other outside of the building. To my knowledge, that's the extent of the cameras that I know. You testified that there was there was no way you could imagine a hundred. You were pretty much a hundred percent sure to yourself that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, while they may have been there, were not in the building. Correct. That's correct. And you testified you would have thought they would have taken off and run. Correct. Correct. If they were smarter criminals, they would have taken off and run. Your Honor, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure she wants an answer to answer that, but I, it's not an appropriate question. He doesn't, he gonna, doesn't know how I'm smart of criminals Excuse me, I'm going to just withdraw the question. Okay, well that becomes him to speculate. So obviously you reported all of that. That's the extent um, of your involvement in the case, the 911 tape, correct? Yes. And then you've worked with the prosecutor to prepare for your testimony today. More or less. Okay. I have no other further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Briefly, we, we met one time at the office, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I asked you what happened? Yes. Okay. Um, were you, when you were hiding in your, in your office, but in, that, in that corner, mm -hmm. were, you, were you hiding from uh, law enforcement? No. Who were you hiding from? Uh, 
Uh, well, so I sat in that corner specifically because I thought it was the most uh, far away from the windows in the instance somebody would hear something out there or if something really bad were to happen, you know, if somebody was armed or something, uh, could have shot through a window. Um, but when you saw door. law enforcement... I was already outside right when law enforcement arrived. Right, so you weren't afraid of the law enforcement? No. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Can you excuse me? Yes, you can step down. Thank you. Who's next to this? We have <coughs> Corporal David Shaw in the hallway. Corporal <coughs> David Shaw. <coughs> to the City of Detroit Special Response Team? Uh, for approximately 10 years. 10 years? Yes, sir. Okay. And where did you work prior to that? I uh, worked on the Eastern District, which is uh, like a constant and crashes. Okay. So would that be um, a patrol officer? Correct. Yes. Okay. So tell us, Jerry, please, what are some of the responsibilities of a member of the Detroit Police Special Response Team? Um, the Special Response Team serves high-risk search warrants, um, usually for homicide suspects, uh, or dangerous people, and then we also do barricaded government, so um, get domestic violence and someone barricaded in the house. They don't want to come out. Police officers will call us and we respond to that scene. Okay. So you've had specific training when it comes to executing um, search warrants and arrest warrants? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, how many, we would call this a raid. Would that be right? Um, fair? That's, that's fair. Okay. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Yep. Okay. So how many times have you executed either a search warrant or an arrest warrant? Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I mean, Give us the ballpark if you can. Probably hundreds. I know what, I have 173 barricaded gunmen instances we've, I've dealt with. Um, 173 barricaded gunmen alone? Correct. Correct. Okay. So, and then on top of that, the search warrants, we don't, I don't keep track of that off the top of my head, but I would say more than, more than 200. Easy. Okay, so you've been doing this for about a decade? Correct. And is this the, the routine practice of the Detroit Police Special Response Team? Okay. Okay. Now I want to direct your attention to Friday, December the 3rd, 2021, approximately 11.30 p.m. Okay. Do you recall that dating time? I do. Okay. And did you have occasion to be uh, recalled to 1111 Bellevue in the city of Detroit? Uh, yep. Um, got recalled for a search for a wanted fugitive. That was, that was the, recall, the recall we got. So that was the only information I got prior to getting there. Okay. Now when I, I say recall, what does that mean? Um, so our commander will call our lieutenant who then <coughs> texts our sergeants and they send out a, a text message to our whole team that says come back to the base or respond to this particular address. In, oh. this, in this case it was respond to this <coughs> area. Um, and Once I got there it was Give more information at that time. Okay. So, I take it 11.30 at night on that Friday night, you weren't in the office itself. Would that be correct? Yeah. Oh, that okay. So, when you recalled, you're, you're always on call, but you're called to duty? Correct. Okay. So, as a member of the special response team, is it fair to say that you're always on call? <coughs> always on call. Yeah. Always on call. Okay. So, approximately what time did you arrive at that location? Um, usually, I'm usually pretty quick. That's roughly 20 minutes from my house, maybe 25 minutes. Before I got to that scene. Okay. 
So if you got the message about 11.30, would it be fair to say you arrived before midnight? Oh, yeah. Now what type what type of building is at that location? Um, there's a large, I want to call it maybe an industrial type building. Um, if I showed you some pictures, would that help? Yeah. So we have people's 348, 349, and 351 for this witness. 348 and 351. Three, 349 and 351. We have no we have no objection to those. Right. 348, 348, 349. And 351. 351, not 350. Correct, that's what this one uh, Sir, on the screen in front of you, can you see the People's Admit Exhibit 348? I do. Okay, and what am I looking at in this photograph here? It looks like an industrial building to me. Okay, so this is the address 1111 Bellevue and Savings, right? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a yes? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. And this is, oh, I'm sorry. This is People's Admitted 349. This is the same building? It uh, looks to be, uh, yes. Okay. Um, and this is People's 351. Again, photograph of 1111 Bellevue. Yes, sir. Okay. So when you arrived, sir, tell me what you saw, your initial observations. Uh, there's a ton of police cars initially. Um, at, with this particular incident, um, there wasn't anywhere to set up on, like a barricade government would be, so I kind of waited until we had more officers that show up to the scene um, prior to making entry into the building. Okay. Um, so let me stop you right there. You said a ton of officers are already in scene. Was that your team members or were no, other officers? there was other people. Um, so there was, I, I couldn't tell you what agencies or what, what units were there, but it was more than just... Okay, so it's more than Detroit Police Special Response. <clears throat> was it also, excuse me, more than just Detroit Police Officers as well? To be honest, I couldn't tell you. I didn't see any other any other city cars, but there was a lot of Detroit Police cars, and then as we started showing up, um, prior, this was prior to making entry. Once we were in the building, there was <coughs> multiple agencies, multiple uh, tactical teams, or at least one other tactical team that we ended up running into while we were clearing. Okay. So, sir, tell me, um, you arrived... A little before midnight, you said, yes. and at that point, were your team members already there? No, I was the first one there. Um, I talked with my, I believe it was a commander or a lieutenant that was on the scene already. He kind of gave me a rundown of what was going on, um, and we kind of kind of formed a plan to wait for other guys to get there before he made entry to the facility. Okay. So you were recalled from your home, you said? Correct. Okay. Were you wearing the uniform you're wearing today? Uh, no, sir. <coughs> Tell me what you were wearing. Uh, it's a. Uh, essentially an unmarked um, uniform, but it's a black tactical shirt, which allows me to apply patches to each each shoulder, so I'm able to identify myself as a Detroit police officer. Um, then I have a heavy vest on that says police across the chest. Heavy vest is what? Uh, it's a bullet or ballistic vest uh, okay. with you know heavy plates on the inside for, for you know protection from firearms. Uh, helmet, usually a mask, but this time it's pretty cold, so I usually do wear a um, Face covering. Um, also, I have my badge on my my rig that I use for my gun belt, and that's essentially it. everything's all black though, except for the police and white lettering across. Okay, the and that's the standard uniform of the Detroit Police Special Response Team. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so once you met with the other team members and a plan was um, organized, what happened next? Uh, we actually made entry into this um, building where we, there was also there was a, a ton of officers there already. Give us an idea of how many. On the main floor, when we first went through that, through the front door, there was say, roughly 20 people in there, um, just in the initial spot. Just in the main entryway? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there were officers that were dressed kind of plain clothes, um, some guys that maybe, they're dressed like DFAT, which would be like jeans and a shirt, but a vest that uh, identifies them as police. What's DFAT? Uh, Detroit's a fugitive apprehension team. Okay. Um, and there was, there was other, like I said, other officers there that looked to be like a tactical team. Okay. So you weren't the only special response team on the scene? Uh, I wouldn't say no. All right. And we've already heard testimony that this building had three floors to it. Is that accurate? Yep. Okay. Yes, so tell us, sir, what, what is the first thing that the Detroit Police Department special response team did? So um, after making entry, um, we started searching the main floor kind of slowly, 
Uh, I know we did breach one or two doors on the initial entry. Um, there's a room right to our, our right when we went into the door. We had to breach a double door. We breached that one. And we Let me stop you right there. Breach, what does that mean? And we used a, uh, a ram and a manual breach is you're breaking the door open, you're defeating the locking mechanism. Okay. Um, and that's what we did. So that was on the first um, floor of this building? Yes, sir. Okay, so you, who, who used the RAM? Was it you or another member? It was another member. Okay. So describe to us what happens when you use the breach to defeat a locking mechanism. Uh, you're essentially banging a 35 pound metal RAM against the door uh, until it opens. Until it opens? Okay. Yeah. And were you able to breach that door in this particular instance? Uh, yes. Okay. And what was found in that room, if you recall? Uh, nothing. It actually ended up wrapping around to another door. Um, we ended up going out that door and back into the hallway that we were in, but we had cleared that that room and the conjoining room before we went back out to the hallway. Okay. Now, at some point, was Detroit Police Department's special response team coordinating with other tactical units on scene? I, I believe my commander was, or my sergeant. I was not personally. That's um, fair. But I couldn't. I, I, would, I would assume they were. Um, okay. So just walk us through then where your particular team went that evening. Uh, we started on the main floor and we were given information that the two wanted fugitives went up to the second floor and never returned back downstairs. Um, so that kind of forced our, our way, that kind of pushed us to the second floor. Were other officers on the second floor already? Correct. And that, yes. And that's, uh, that's when we ran into that second tactical team who said they had cleared the second floor, they cleared all the open doors. Okay. Um, so we ended up clearing the, the closed doors as much as we could. At some point, somebody gained access to a, a, a ring of keys, and we were opening the, the closed door, locked doors with the keys. Okay. Now, at this point in time, when the tactical units were inside the building, were there other police officers on the exterior of the building? Yeah, there was police officers. I, I would assume, uh, I'd be guessing at this point, but I would bet there was police on the perimeter of the building. Actually. Okay. And you said police everywhere? Yeah. Were there um, emergency lights <laughs> activated in vehicles? I'm not 100% sure with that. That's okay. Um, was it just the tactical units then inside the building at this point? There was a canine officer as well. Canine as well? We utilized canine uh, officers on, a canine officer on the second floor who checked each door prior to us opening it with the dog and we never obviously got any hits from the dog on the second floor. Okay. And to your knowledge, were there other teams on the third floor at this point in time as well? I'm not 100% sure. That's fair. Um, where did you go after the second floor was cleared? If I'm not mistaken, I think we went up to the third floor um, <coughs> before returning back down to the main floor. Okay. So at some point in time, you and your team returned back to the first floor. Correct. Okay. And why did you do that? Um, at some point, my one of my supervisors was given information that the room, these uh, the wine fugitive we're supposed to be in was on the first floor. Um, at some point, someone asked if it had already been cleared, and which they said no. So, uh, okay, so we went back down directly to that room. Okay, and you were given a set of keys for that? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, do you recall who gave you the keys? I, I, I never got the keys. Uh, somebody opened the door for me. I was just number one into, the door, into that room. Okay, so tell me, that suite in particular, um, if I told you it was suite 130, would that sound right to you? Okay. Um, that suite in particular, what's the proximity from that location to the location where you used the 35 pound ram to kick in the door? It, it's on the same floor on the same side of the building. Um, if I had to guess, maybe 10 or 15 feet away. Okay. Like that. All right. Now, at this point in time, were the Detroit Police Department special response team equipped with body worn cameras? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And to your knowledge, was yours activated at night? Uh, yes, sir. Now, how long would you say that your particular team was on this location from the time you arrived to the time that you entered Suite 130? I guess maybe an hour, hour and a half. Okay. Two hours tops, but I'd be guessing at this point. That's okay. Um, just an estimate. That's all we're asking. Yep. Um, and during that hour, hour and a half, up to two hours, were other tactical teams also clearing other rooms? Uh, yes, sir. Now your body worn camera would have a, a date and time stamp on it, if you know. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. This is going to be people's 347. I don't believe there's an objection. 
No, there's not. We stipulate to the admission. 47 is admitted. December the 4th, 2021, at 1.33 in the morning. Okay. Is that, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this is camera from your um, body camera. Yes, sir. Okay, tell us quickly, where is that camera affixed on your uniform? Um, I have it affixed uh, to the right side of my chest, just underneath uh, my uh, magazine carrier. Okay. There's, I have a lot of stuff here, but it's just a space pretty much right underneath my right arm. We see a lot of stuff here. We're talking about the tactical vest you described? Yes, sir. Okay. Special response team's function to actually search for evidentiary items just for weapons? Correct. Uh, at this point, it's more of a, a safety search. Before we let anybody into this room, we're going to make sure that we know where weapons are and make sure they're secure before anybody else coming from the public or not from our team is in that room. Okay. And there were no weapons located in this search? I did not find any weapons. Okay. No. But an actual search of this location will be conducted by members of the um, uh, crime scene unit. Would that be right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir.
137 and well, 137 a.m. 41 seconds. Where my cursor is, this is a window. Oh yes, sir. Okay, and those are the windows we saw in the photographs earlier admitted that face the parking lot. Yes, sir. All right. Um, now, once, do you even uh, know the identities of the individuals, if you recall? I believe after uh, before we made entry, we were given information that uh, we were looking for these particular people. Okay. So it's James and Jennifer Crumley. Yes, sir. Okay, fair to say it wasn't a Detroit Police Department um, law enforcement investigation. Uh, yes, okay, so you were given the information that the fugitives could have been there. Yes, sir. Right. Um, once James and Jennifer Crumbly were um, taken from this location, were they turned over to uh, members of Oakland County? <coughs> turned over to, I believe, um, our DFAT unit right at the door to this room. Okay. Uh, and that was once we, that's when we, we as a team released custody to those. All right, but that wouldn't have been your function would happen with them after. Right now. Okay. Now, from the video, it depicts that they were found on a mattress on the floor of this um, suite. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you have uh, testified that you used a ram to breach a door about 10 or 15 feet away from the entry door to this suite? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. And that was before that you made entry into this particular room? That was initially when we first made entry into this building, um, maybe an hour prior to that. Okay, and then this this arrest occurred after teams, other tactical units, had already searched floors two and three, as well as other rooms in floor one? Yes, sir. Okay, and this is after all of those officers were on scene? Yes, sir. Now, in your experience in 10 years with special response, you said you've, you've executed, if you could even ballpark, hundreds of arrest warrants. Was that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, in your experience, have you caught anyone asleep before? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, what was your impression if James and Jennifer Crumley were asleep or not when you entered the room? Uh, your Honor, I would object. This calls for speculation. The video speaks for itself, and really the appropriate person to ask is Mrs. Crumley if she was asleep. Okay. Well, I think he, the foundation's been laid that he's been on hundreds of these executions. He hasn't well, seen Mr. and Mrs. Crumley sleep a hundred times. Okay, well, I, I think he can describe exactly what he saw. Sure, I mean, if I close my eyes right now, I don't know if you know if I'm asleep or not. I mean, I probably am, but, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, but you, can, you don't know if someone's asleep just because their eyes are closed. I'm just right? asking his impression. Were, are his eyes closed? Were their eyes closed? Were they moving or not moving? Like, you know, you can ask those types of questions. Give us, give us the, paint the picture for us, what you perceived. Uh, I, as I made entry, uh, I see two people laying on a mattress. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they're facing each other, uh, not moving, not making a sound. Okay, and that's after your entire team entered the suite? Correct. Okay, and after the, the door was breached 15 feet away? Yes, sir. Right. I have nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In the video, after you guys find the people on the mattress, there's a person that's making yelling noises. Are you aware of who is yelling? Uh, it would be Mr. James Crum Crumbly, ma'am. And did you see or observe Mrs. Crumbly making any noises? I did not. There's a little bit of conversation we hear on the video about eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And that was Mrs. Crumbly asking if she could please have her eyeglasses. Okay. Is that fair? To be honest, I, looking back at it, watching the video, I thought it was Mr. Crumbly saying that was his glasses on the mattress. I, mean, I just watched the video, um, so I may be mistaken. Okay, I have no further questions. Thank you. Here you go. No. Okay, you can step down in your excuse. Um, the jury's lunch is up here. So unless you had somebody super short. You had a super short witness. We take it now. If not, can you tell me who the witness next no, is? No, but uh, we could rest today, Judge. So um, okay. we are going to meet with the remaining witnesses we have. We'll decide how many more we need to put on. So counsel has requested um, to know, and I believe she should be prepared to begin her, her case today if she chooses to present one. Your Honor, I am going to present one, but I am not prepared as I know okay. the court. 
Uh, okay, you could be prepared to present your case, if, if any, um, tomorrow morning. If the prosecution rests, um, I, I want to reiterate that the defense doesn't have to do anything. Uh, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Crumley can sit here and play chess if they'd like, all right? Uh, they don't have to do anything, but if they choose to do so, um, you can do it tomorrow morning. Thank you. Pardon right. me, Your Honor. He left his phone. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. All right. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to have you come back at, um, at that quarter to one. Okay, your lunches are here. Uh, please don't discuss the case with anyone, with each other. Don't Google anything. Don't go on the phone. Don't post anything. Don't read any news and don't uh, look at it, any TV about the case. All right? All right for the jury. something I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond, um, which you did, but in your response you say there's a separate non-public response. Yes, Judge, oh. yes. because the information is covered by the protective order, we yeah. wanted to make sure not to put anything in the public domain. Sure. So if that has not been sent privately to the, to the court, I'll confirm with her. Oh, okay, that, that was my question. Of course, of course we don't want it to be made public, but um, your response references another response that we don't have yet. It might be there by now. Your Honor, I, I have not, and it might be in my email right now. It what, probably is. Was that filed today? Just today. Within like an hour ago. Okay, so yeah. I need to re review their response in whatever private document they submitted. I want to make sure the court received, there was a private document I submitted as I well that. as a public one. Okay, I have that. thank you. In fact, I would be happy to give you my copy. I've circled some things. If you would be so kind, I don't have a printer. Here. Actually, we'll print you. We'll thank, print you. One. Thank, okay. you thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'll see you here at quarter to one. Um, if, if in fact the prosecution rests today, then you would, uh, if if you plan to present evidence, it would be tomorrow morning. Um, but um, based on your your motion and the response, I don't know if I need to make any further rulings with regard to the privilege issue and the Fifth Amendment issue. Um, so that's that's kind of what I was waiting to see. Okay. I need to take a look at their response in order to evaluate that. Oh, uh, oh, I understand. I do too. But okay. I, I may or may not uh, do. I have some ideas about what to do about that, but I wanted to see. Uh, the prosecutor's response first, and of course you can see that. As okay, well. that's understandable. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. We'll, we'll put that for you. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. All that. right.
response <clears throat> was it also excuse me more than just Detroit police officers as well to be honest I couldn't tell you I didn't see any other any other city cars but there was a lot of Detroit police cars and then as we started showing up um, prior this was prior to making entry once we were in the building there was <coughs> multiple agencies multiple uh, tactical teams or at least one of the tactical teams that we ended up running into mm -hmm. while we were clearing. okay so sir tell me um, you arrived a little before midnight, you said, yes. and at that point, were your team members already there?